I just watched When Evil Lurks and it was pretty great. This is a strange comparison, but I recently watched a film from 2020 called The Dark and the Wicked, directed by Brian Bertino, the guy who brought us The Strangers. And that movie, The Dark and the Wicked, was sold to me as being beyond terrifying and unsettling. And while it was well composed and mostly well executed, I just found it to be above average. A phrase I use to refer to films well made but just didn't do it for me and I probably won't revisit them. And that movie had a similar premise to When Evil Lurks. I don't want to go into spoilers, so I'll simply say both films involve a demon preying upon a group of people by possessing everyone around them as well as people within their group. When Evil Lurks executes this premise with far more excellence, which says a lot for me because I can be a sucker for great cinematography. And while The Dark and the Wicked had better cinematography, arguably, with excellent wide shots and one particularly excellent zoom out shot, which was truly effective, I still found When Evil Lurks to be a superior film with that similar premise. Have you heard this new annoying term, elevated horror, referring to films released since around 2014, many of them being produced by A24, with prime examples including Get Out, It Follows, The Babadook, Hereditary, and many more. And don't get me wrong, these are all good movies. I love The Babadook. I love It Follows. But the problem with the term, elevated horror, is that it refers to modern horror films marked by meticulous execution and complex themes and messages. Or at least, that's what someone who uses the term as a fan of the non-existent subgenre would tell you. If you ask me, elevated horror is just a fancy, more or less telling way of saying horror movies that are actually good. Simply because for over a decade, primarily the 1990s through the early 2010s, good, much less great horror films were difficult to come by. And the best word I can use to describe many of these so-called elevated horror films is unsettling because bad horror movies from the mid 90s to the early 2010s were marked by an over-dependence on jump scares, bad acting or overacting, meaningless and forgettable gore, etc. But now that horror film producers and directors are trying to make good horror movies again, moving away from those cliches naturally means bringing the genre home to its slower, more suspenseful and mysterious roots. It's honestly insulting to horror fans and film buffs in general, because horror has always been good. Halloween, The Thing, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Shining, House on Haunted Hill, and others. And during that bad horror movie time period, we still had some good to even great, even classic horror films such as Scream, The Descent, The Conjuring, The Others, Saw, 28 Days Later, one of my favorite horror films and probably my favorite zombie film. And even the remakes of Dawn of the Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre were pretty solid. How does a comparison with The Dark and the Wicked and a long spiel about elevated horror bring me back to a review of When Evil Lurks? Well, stop asking questions and let me tell you. When Evil Lurks is a 2023 horror film written and directed by Demian Rudna. And while the film is a co-production between the US and Argentina, the characters speak in Spanish, so unless you can speak Spanish, you'd better be okay with subtitles unless you want to miss out on an awesome movie. The film follows Pedro, a man who is completely estranged from his remarried wife and his children, and his brother who inadvertently stumble across a rotten, a term the film uses for a person possessed by a physically unborn demon who will wreak havoc if the demon reaches physical birth. A cleaner, another term the film uses, was called to appropriately dispose of the rotten to prevent the birth. But of course things go wrong and we then follow Pedro and his brother through a series of twists and turns involving either attempting to properly cleanse or simply escape and tread far away before the demon is born. And that's all I'm going to say about the premise because this modern horror film stands out from other great horror films by being a fast paced thriller. Suspense is a great tool for any horror film, and the film does have its cooldown moments as well as scenes where suspense is employed, but these scenes are often followed by an immediate reaction from the characters in the film which lead to more thrills or even a full sequence. This is not a horror suspense film, this is a horror thriller, which is unusual for a demonic possession film and this movie distinguishes itself from other modern horror films in current times by doing so. From the opening scene, 
there's little to no setup leading into the film. Within the first minute, the catalyst for what leads into the narrative occurs, and the movie does not stop from there. And we learn about the characters through their reaction to events and conversations during those cooldown moments, and there's never a moment where I know what's coming next. And keep in mind, just because a thriller manages to constantly surprise you doesn't mean it's well executed. But this film accomplishes this difficult task by keeping the characters' motivations and sensibilities in mind and recognizes the crucialness of a coherent narrative that shouldn't be fractured for the sake of twists and turns. Pedro, played by Ezequiel Rodriguez, is the leading man in this film. Forgive me if I mispronounced that name. And while he does make many bad choices throughout the narrative, those bad choices are a result of the character's own weaknesses and the sheer cunningness of the demonic antagonist. This is an excellent performance because this truly feels like an average, not so savory man who simply stumbled upon a grisly scene and that leads to an unprecedented situation and he has to make a choice leading to a complex narrative, similar to Josh Brolin's portrayal of Llewellyn Moss, another everyman character from No Country for Old Men, which is a brilliant portrayal of an average person, again, stumbling across a complicated situation and making a choice. Most of the actors and actresses give a good performance, including Pedro's brother, who we know very little about, but his reactions and emotionality feels very compelling and authentic, and Pedro's mother, who, whose immediate introduction suggests detachment and a possibly deteriorated mind, only to soon reveal she is sharper and even more brash than both of her sons, going so far as to share too much grisly information about the rotten with Pedro's son, and keeps a cool head when things happen and is able to immediately communicate what's happening and not totally freak out. All too often, elders in supernatural films know too much about the evil presence leading into the story and then freak out and begin rambling when the evil presence takes hold. Just like her sons, this mother feels real in her care for her sons and grandsons but also sympathizes with other characters and doesn't know exactly what to do when she realizes what's happening is really happening. And even though she knows this info, this leads us to another powerful point in the film about her and all the characters. All the characters in this film, which takes place in, I assume, Argentina or at least a South American country, recognize the existence of the possibility of the situation, the rotten. It's quite compelling. It's not presented as, I've heard the folklore, but I have to see it to believe it. It's just a thing people are aware of, almost as though it's not folklore at all. It's not supernatural, it's just a component of their local community. There are characters who, for understandable reasons, question whether there really is a possessed person or rotten in the area, but they don't deny what is apparently a known existence of the rotten. And a character is introduced who knows how to defeat the demon. And while I was worried the narrative would delve into the cliché, of a shaman-esque character who knows a correct ritual to banish the demon. Instead, there is a practical and methodical way of ridding the rotten without allowing the demon to be birthed. This is a very compelling component because while the demon is a supernatural presence, the demon's methods of controlling people and possessing a person resonates with a more biological and psychological essence rather than a spiritual tone. This is very refreshing because the demon in many films often come across as pure evil who derives satisfaction from preying upon its victims' fears, terrifying the characters and the audience through shock and depravity, and seems to have a very human goal as opposed to something beyond comprehension such as a demon entity might be. The film cleverly juxtaposes the more infectious and psychobiological nature of the demon spread with a demon whose actions are in response to the character's choices, with its only true goal being birth. The demon rarely speaks as itself through possessed or controlled people, and when it does, even if it seems to have a personality mirroring <clears throat> even if it seems to have a personality mirroring a psychotic person or an evil demon, you realize it doesn't have an emotional stake and is simply trying to make things happen or prevent things from happening. I would go so far as to say the demon is more of a virus, a biological agent which isn't necessarily alive or dead, with a singular mind 
and when it preys on characters' fears, it preys on immediate anxieties rather than long-held fears or trauma. Many of the people the demon controls seem to eventually go off on their own, as though the demon has lowered its influence on the person, yet the person continues to engage in depraved and frankly freakish behavior simply by having been affected by this demon. Even though I compare this film's cinematography as arguably inferior to another film, it's still very good, especially with its use of tracking shots during action sequences and the composition sells many of the thrilling scenes and makes clever choices what to keep in the foreground or background relative to the effect the shot is supposed to have, often transitioning between what's being focused on the same scene and still managing to surprise the viewer with what happens. As I said, there are a few suspenseful scenes, but many of the most shocking and horrific events have no buildup, and it's a follow-up to something happening, such as an action by the demon, that enthralled me. Its editing is sleek, and I've always seen editing being the final ingredient in good cinematography to ensure the shots don't only look interesting but have purpose. And most of the cuts in this film make sense and it neither overuses transitions nor holds too long on any shot in such a way that removed me from the film. If I had any criticism, there is an occasional mention of rules one must follow when engaging the demon that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, such as the use of electricity and to refrain from physically hurting the demon or the possessed person, the rotten, but also specifically says not to shoot them with gunfire. I feel like refraining from harming them encapsulates the specific notion of shooting them, and there's never a revelation of what happens specifically if gunfire is used, so since there's an apparently specific and methodical way of defeating the demon, I don't know what point the no gunfire rule has in the, in the narrative. There's also a scene where we come across some possessed children. Now, at first, the creepiness of the possessed children comes across as a cliched portrayal of the creepy kid trope. But the film does do some clever stuff with how the demon uses the children to manipulate the main characters, but the same scene ends with what seems like an ending for a different movie that felt out of place and a bit self-indulgent. Something we didn't necessarily have to see, and its exclusion would have made the bleak and powerful final scene even more challenging if it had have been left to the imagination rather than presenting what was shown. If you haven't seen this film or haven't heard of it, please check it out because this film manages to capture truly unsettling imagery and a more fast paced thriller with unsettling substance and themes backing up that imagery. The direction is meticulous and the narrative and themes are compelling. I wouldn't call this film a masterpiece, but I would say it's pretty great and well worth your time. This is Noah Fryman from Poisoned Apple and I don't quantify ratings for movies.